So this is John Reed with Tichinomica back in the podcast game, and I've got an old familiar face that you won't see his face because we're going old school. We're doing audio only taping. John Appleby, CEO of Entre. What's going on? Nice. We're doing audio only, so I get to see your happy smiling face, but then we're going to yeah. cut it out. That's cool. Like yeah, it. yeah. We're gonna we're gonna we'll cut out the video part. Uh, but I do remember long before you were CEO sticking up mic in your face at sapphire for our epic sapphire reviews with uh den hallett and i we had our video studio back when den was riding high in the enterprise saddle before he retired and we would always do the lowdown of like what really just happened at sapphire and this year you and i didn't really get to do that well we kind of did it like sitting out in the middle of the uh hilton orlando parking lot but we didn't r record it so that was a shame. But then you went to SAP Insider a little bit later. And that prompted us to kind of just do a little rehash of what what do SAP customers care about now heading into the this all-important sort of fall uh, period for enterprise software. And so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to find out how Insider went because I did not go. You know, you told me after you came back that it kind of changed your view of enterprise events and stuff. So it's, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that, you know, there was a time when we first started doing SAP events, when SAP controlled the whole event schedule um, for the whole year. And, and, you know, Sapphire went around the world. It was in, it was in the U S in Orlando and it was in EMEA later in the year and then there was the tech ed schedule and so they controlled the whole event schedule and i feel like that's kind of really turned on its head right now because you know sap has this small regional sapphire events which are, are you know very decision maker focused you know for good or for bad that's how it is um but that means that for the you know the the unwashed masses that used to go they're not invited so they don't get to see that and in the meantime, you know, you've got Insider and you've got ASUG um, who are both, you know, vying for, you know, broader control of events. And so, you know, we saw, you know, with Insider, them trying to step up to be, you know, the de facto North America event. And by the way, they're, they're running one, I think, in Vienna in November. So they've got global expansion on their mind. And they want the one in March to be even bigger. So we're seeing a real shift in how the events landscape is is looking. Yeah, and I think SAP may make some changes next year based on some of the controversies that happen with this year's Sapphire. And we can, you know, probably avoid getting into that too much because I don't think that's our core topic today. But right. in 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 general, uh, you know, I do think that this kind of like extravagant big event era is is not coming back anytime soon and i think there's a lot of positives to it because there was this thing that happened so often and not just in sap but like you go to this huge event you'd have awesome time high fives drinks big plans awesome connections and then you'd spend like a month kind of regrouping and then it would you kind of lose your thread and then you wouldn't see people for another year and a lot of time goes by and a lot of things change and to me, what gets interesting about this sort of possibility of smaller events is how can we kind of stay connected throughout the year and keep these conversations going? Because the stuff you, you and I are going to talk about today, like what matters to SAP customers, it doesn't feel like you want to wait a year to revisit those conversations. I mean, obviously, there was always sort of the tech head season in the fall, but the point is like, I kind of like this opportunity, but it will be interesting to see which events really get traction. Because as you say, asuc has got a lot of stuff going on too, and and insider and then internationally there's a bunch of different there's the eventful group doing stuff so it'll be interesting yep. to see who who lands yeah there's the eventful group as well i mean i think that the question specific to the u.s as well is how do you how do you get somewhat functional about an event so it's about me my role you know i'm a business analyst or i'm an hcm expert so how do we get something that's like really attractive to me um but also how do you balance national versus local um because that's the benefit of a big event right is you can say well i can be all things to all people because i'll have an hcm track and everyone's coming so it's okay to be national 
And I, I'm not sure I quite know the answer to that or that they do either. Yeah, well, it's going to be an interesting time to see if if enterprises can can really come up with events that that, that really matter because I think we're going to have this period – like everyone's excited to see each other, so they kind of got a hall pass. But but now it's going to be like, do I want to get on a plane and go to another event? Like you better get me there. And my whole thing, and I'm not going to turn this into a rant about events because I've done that plenty on Digonomic already. But I just I see events as sort of a failure of imagination for the most part. Which brings me to SAP Insider because I have been to a couple of their events in the distant past, and and I can't say that they made a big impression on me one way or the other. I'm not saying they were bad events, but I, I, I'm not really leaving kind of with that charged up feeling. Um, and yet you kind of sounded pretty charged up after I talked to you. So do you think something's changed or they're starting to figure some stuff out or? I think there's a, there's a few things going on. I think first of all, I've changed. So, so the bar for an event was pretty low, um, especially, you know, post Sapphire. Um, I, I feel like the bar was not as high as it's been in the past. I was glad to get back. I was glad to network and meet with people I hadn't seen in, in two, three years. And so I was sort of grateful to have a platform and somewhere where we could take our business and have conversations. So I think that's the first side is the bar was a little bit low. Um, but I, I think the the other side is there's a hunger for people to have a user group style event where the people that use the software come along and they talk. And I, I do feel like Insider did a good job there of focusing the content tracks all around customers, customer stories. You know, you get the occasional vendor pitch, um, but, you know, you're going to get a bit of that. But by and large, I think they did a really good job of being customer-centric and making sure customers were on presentations and people had things where you could go and learn um, not at too detailed a level. This wasn't, you know, tech ed style technical training, but you could, you actually felt when you went to the thing is that you left a little bit more knowledgeable than when you arrived. And I think for a lot of people going to those events, that's what they're looking for. Yeah. And one thing I have wanted to see more of, and pretty much I'm not picking on SAP here because I would throw this up to any vendor is, you know, vendor sponsored events are fine and worth going to, but then, when you go to an event that's not not run by the vendor, I think it does allow you to take a more maybe objective pulse on what matters to customers truly, right? Because you're not necessarily saying, okay, this is our marketing message we're going to emphasize on the show floor and in the keynotes. So that brings us to Rise with SAP because you had the chance to kind of take the pulse of that in the sense that SAP has been pushing Rise very aggressively uh, in a lot of different ways, uh, in both in earnings reports and also, you know, in terms of cloud adoption and hyperscaler traction, and then also at Sapphire. So at SAP Insider, you had a chance to kind of take in Rise, but more from stepping back of like, what does the community care about? Do they want to talk about Rise? So at the risk of getting you into trouble with SAP, and we may get you into trouble a few times before we're done here, uh, what, what did you learn here? I, so I think if, let's talk about Insider specifically first, because the thing that's really interesting about Insider is SAP didn't really sponsor it. I mean, they had a presence and um, that presence was a non-RISE presence. It was all about applications of minor business and, and they, they brought a bunch of experts from around the world. And I, I think people uh, and a lot of people I knew and I've worked with in the past and they were great people to have at that event because if you wanted to talk about analytics or business technology platform or ACM, they had an expert there. And I think that was great. So um, that's the one side. But because SAP wasn't there with a big rise flag, um, there wasn't so much of a big rise flag elsewhere. And, and what I see, you know, with the hyperscale partners and the systems integrator partners and the technology partners alike is that they're, they're quite agnostic in their approach to rise. Um, you know, you'll talk to one of the big SIs and they'll be like, yeah, we absolutely support Rise. And But by the way, if you don't want to do Rise, we'll absolutely support you. We'd like to work with you either way. Let us know how you want to work. So I see I see the partners being really agnostic. And in this particular show, for whatever reason, SAP didn't come, you know, waving a, a Rise flag. Yeah, I wish I had that experience all the time because I, 
when I write about SAP, I usually get angry LinkedIn messages from partners taking issue with SAPs, what they perceive as SAPs over promotion of rise or their own problems with rise. And, uh, it, you know, it's interesting because I find myself in the awkward position of defending SAP and defending rise. And, uh, and I'm not a, I'm not a huge rise advocate other than the fact that I like, I don't like this sort of notion that it sort of like you spread it all over everything and it, it sort of solves all your transformation problems and things like that. But I do, I do defend very much for SAP why they need this in the face of the hyperscalers and they need to be able to stand stand up an alternative to that. And, you know, what I would love to see is more of what you're talking about, which is partners really embracing this notion of, yeah, you know, if you you know, if you want to talk about rise, we could talk about rise. If you want to talk about alternatives to rise, we can do that. Like to me, that's the true sort of like versatile sort of advisory type of vibe that I want partners to ideally have. And I hope that's how it settles out. Cause I, and I, it's hard for me to judge because I, I tend to attract the disgruntled in some ways, I think. So. <laughs> and also bear in mind that, you know, if, if you're going around in the conference like this, the, the SIs are not going to trash SAP, even if they don't agree with the strategy. That, the, that part of their talk track coming into these is to find a way to be copacetic. And that's, that's how it is. But, you know, but just to, to be clear on rise i mean if you if you take sap's you know market cap versus its revenues right they're about 27 uh call it 30 million dollars of revenues and 115 million dollars of market cap so if you take that ratio and you compare that to a pure play uh vendor like a service now there's about 6 billion dollars of revenue and 100 million dollars of market cap you can see how that valuation of a subscription revenue is attractive to a CEO and to shareholders. So you can see the transition that Christian's trying to make. And it's it's not as much as it is about business transformation as a service, it's about moving customers to a subscription model. Right. And uh, you know, my sense is very clear on this, which is SA, the Rise model will start to soften a little bit as we head into 2023. And is it'll be less about controlling the transformation journey and more around flexibility of models provided you're willing to move to a subscription model. Um, and, and from there, of course, that gives a lot more scope for the partners to be on board because they get to keep their piece of the pie, which is you know part of what causes the conflict today. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. And, and, I, and I do think that, that if you place it in a context – I have been impressed that there are certain customers that really do value the opportunity to look at at a rise, but it's to your point, it really isn't a transformation conversation per se. It's, it's a hyperscaler conversation. It's a cloud conversation. It's a subscription OPEX model conversation. That's what rise really is in my view. Now, you know, it, it's interesting because I think one thing SAP could do if they want to really emphasize the transformation part of this is through Signavio and through more of a process intelligence assessment and I have been bugging SAP for a long time now to create a free version of of that that they can sort of sit down with potential prospects and say, let's have a transformation conversation first. Let's look at your existing processes and how they can be improved. The Rise conversation to me is a terrible way to start a transformation conversation because you're leading with product. I mean, Rise technically isn't a product, but you know what I mean. You're leading with a sales pitch at that point, and that's where I think it hasn't worked. But I think it's a discrete offering. It does work for those who need it, so... Yeah, I mean, in Rise specifically, you know, I've said this a hundred times to you before, I'm sure. But if I were a mid-market customer uh, looking to implement a Greenfield ERP, um, Rise would be right at the top of my list because I get one contract, I get one throat to choke, the system's managed by somebody else, and I can hold somebody accountable and I can manage the cost through the contract. I think that's I think that's a, a great situation. When I first talked to the SAP board about Rise three years ago, that's what they were positioning. I think where it gets really complicated is I take an example of a customer I spoke to the other week. They're a, they're a manufacturer um, that also does some B two B retail, and um, they have a very old ERP that was part of a divestiture 15, 20 years ago. A company code copy of an SAP system uh, with thirty thousand custom objects in it, and it works and it works great for them um 
And they've got a bunch of other priorities going on within the business. You know, we were talking about, you know, direct to customer B2B to C marketing while staying B2B for channels. And yet they've got this ERP system that is also, you know, old and needs modernizing and needs to be upgraded by 2027. And so they've got on the one hand, they've got this desire to invest, you know, in the in the front office sales and marketing machine. And then they've got this need to modernize ERP. And how do you get the executive team's direction and, and attention to do that? Um, and, you know, and Rise isn't the answer to that, right? Rise doesn't help us. So that's the trouble. Right. There's still a core business case conversation to be had. Now, uh, now I, I should point out that SAP would, would tell you that they're getting traction in a large enterprise with Rise as well. <laughs> On behalf of SAP, I'm making that making that uh, assertion but uh i don't want to get too sidetracked with a with a deep breakdown of rise because i want to step back a little bit and ask you kind of what you did see as sort of the hot button topics but is there anything final thing you want to say about rise and i realize some listeners may find it frustrating that we didn't actually sort of carefully define rise but the problem is that you know we didn't want to do a rise podcast today we want to talk about some other stuff too so uh we do have more stuff on diginomica that gets deeper into rise uh, you, you've written, I think, some Rise stuff as well on your site, so folks can check it out if they want more. Yeah, just probably to just probably just to, to reiterate that I, I think SAP um, is really good at selling one thing. They're great at having a talk track, um, and what they will do is they will they will adjust the Rise offering to be something that works for customers. And so there are definitely customers for which Rise is a slam dunk today. There are some which is not such a slam dunk. And uh, as we've seen in the past, we saw it with HANA and S4 HANA and the on the cloud stuff. They'll adapt to make it work for the customer as the journey goes along. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty positive on what we'll see next year on that. Yeah, well, I still see the occasional, uh, this is just heck all over again, cynicism So as in the community. So SAP still has some things to prove, but hey, that that's part of the game, right? I'm not here to be cynical, so. <laughs> no, of course not. So, so John, let's let's talk a little bit about just you on the ground, insider, trying to take the pulse of what customers really care about. What jumped out? Um, I mean, it's, it's always difficult to get the pulse of what customers care about without talking to them all. Um, but you can get a real sense from, you know, how the vendors are operating of what they think customers want to talk about and also those that are popular. I thought I saw a couple of threads that were interesting. Um, you know, the first one is, and you probably expect me to say this, automation seems to be everywhere. Um, you know, it was it was every major stand talked about automation. And it I'm didn't sure you matter. Were, uh, I'm sure you were crestfallen, by the way, to see that. <laughs> oh, you know, it's what we believe in. So, so that's okay. But it was interesting. I did not expect the extent of it. And, Automation is totally different for every for every you know vendor that's in that diagram. You know, you might be doing accounts payable automation, you might be doing security automation, or you might be doing operations automation. But each each company had its own take on what automation meant to them. Or you might just be doing business consulting on automation, business process transformation on automation. You might be selling Solanus or something like that. And there's just so many different viewpoints on what automation was to different groups of people. And I was I was really surprised by that. Um, I was also surprised to a degree there seems to be a consolidation going on, you know, even within the ISVs and you know I'll call out the, the friends that say wind shuttle for example and and you know they've been acquired and they've modernized their brand um which is you know it's just kind of a growing up that's going on in the ecosystem and that might be a factor of amount of, of private money that's going on right now um but it's really interesting to see you know there are definitely vendors that are modernizing their their look and feel and it isn't quite you know the 1980s conference that you know you felt when you walk the back streets of Sapphire a couple of years ago, that's changing. There's still there's still some of it, by the way, but it's definitely improving. Yeah, less uh, Microsoft productivity tools 
you know, more, um, more automation. And, you know, what's interesting too, is when I, when I go back like five years ago, I think it was maybe around that time I, I did a podcast with Vinny Merchandani, fellow analyst type. And, uh, I was pressing him pretty hard because he's, he was much more of a, Vinny was a lot more optimistic about the the changes op, autom, automation of various kinds was bringing than I was because I, I felt like you got to look at the human costs of these disruptions. And I, I, I haven't really totally backed off of that. But the one thing I will say for now in the foreseeable future is I think that tension between automation and talent just isn't there the way I thought it would be because right now – they're both an imperative, like, like the skills gap issues across enterprises, across industries are so profound that, that the automation becomes essential, not as a headcount reduction exercise, but as a way to, to do more with less as a way to actually get the job done. I mean, you, you guys had a blog about this too, where you talked about how with, with SAP systems transformations and upgrades and getting your basis people involved in RISE or S4 or whatever, if they're caught up in a lot of routine patching and grunt work of the traditional basis app, I mean, they're not going to be able to do that other stuff. So it's, it's interesting how this is shaken out. So Vinny, I guess in the short term, I'll say you were right. That hurts me to Ooh, say. But. I was going to say that's the first. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you've got to think about automation at a macro and a, and a micro level. And, and those, it, it can be very different depending on the industry. So, I don't want to speak about automation fully generally to the human environment because I, I am I am worried about the human cost in some places. But in our market, you know, you, you've got to bear in mind that SAP is twenty years behind the rest of the market in terms of automation. Uh, I don't think that's unreasonable to say. If you look at what Google does with SRE and what they've built, it's it's incredible. And they don't have the numbers of operators that people have in an SAP environment. And so people are coming out of college and they're not they're not entering the SAP operations world. It, it's an aging market because of that, because people are just not coming into it. And so now you've got these people who are leaving the market and they're retiring. And you, you know, they're retiring en masse, by the way. You know, most people that do SAP operations are between are between forty and sixty right now, um, and, and including including myself. I'm not getting any younger, um, and and as a result in that, if people don't invest in automation, they're not investing in their talent, and they're losing that knowledge as it leaves the workforce. So it, it's not like automation is something taking people's jobs away. It's an absolute imperative to ensure you can continue to manage the, the environments unless you believe that you can just push that, you know, into some um, outsource agreement, either with a, with, with a service provider or with SAP right. But if you do, here's the thing. You're just moving the role and responsibility to someone else. You're not changing the, what, the story about automation. Yeah, and just to be clear for the listeners, we're not going to have an apocalyptic conversation here about the future of automation on a world scale. But <laughs> one of the one one of the reasons why I was concerned about that, I think I didn't quite realize the extent to which because machines are really good at some things, I thought they would become really good at other things really quickly. And that's what hasn't happened. Machines are still really, really good at certain things and perhaps even dramatically better because of the increased scale of the technology behind those things. But machines aren't going to get better at a lot of crucial things for a long time. But when they do, that changes this whole automation conversation completely. But as far as SAP automation is concerned, John, I want to challenge you a little bit. And I actually want to go back to a post that you wrote uh, on Diginomica a while back called Dear CEO, get off your ERP island. And in that piece, you talked about the problem of ERP data and operations silos. And you talked about the issues with ERP not being integrated into IT asset management uh, and not being integrated into IT operations management. So with all these silos, like how, how can you really talk about automation in a meaningful way? You can't, and actually, my my moving as my my moving my thinking has even moved on a little bit from there, which is that um, in order to actually solve the problem we're talking about, you, you need um, three components. You need observability, 
So, you know, what's happening in the environment? And if I just come back to your previous point um, on how machines can be so much better, there's an SAP transaction called SICK. You type in SICK. It's some it's German sense humor, I think. And it'll tell you whether the system is broken in a couple of ways. Um, that's typically run by somebody when they do an upgrade. Guess what? A machine can check that every five minutes. So if something happens that causes the systems to be broken in some way, you never get a human to check that every five minutes. So, so, so machines are, are potentially three orders, four orders of magnitude better at certain repetitive tasks. They don't mind doing them every five minutes. They don't care. It's just a question of the of the cost of overhead. So that's your observability piece. Um, and, the, and the other side is automation. So we have to say, right now, now we've detected this. What are we going to do with that? And, you know, coming back to your point around the brilliance of human creativity, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in, you know, thinking machines that will do detailed root cause analysis and problem solving and self-healing. But we can do simple things. You know, we can say, uh, we, we can have rules and algorithms and, and uh, you know, deep learning algorithms even that say, hey, this isn't how it should be. This patch level is wrong. This is what we change. And then all we need to do is we need workflows in the middle. And we say, right, we've noticed this is wrong. This is the basic thing that we can do to fix it. Uh, you know, we've noticed that our algorithm predicts that you're going to run out of resources in, in, in this disk in, you know, two days' time. Please approve the change request. So when we connect observability to automation through workflows, I think we get a really powerful framework for automation. Um, and that can't be done in an SAP silo because not least, who's approving? <laughs> One of the things I run into in the ERP uh, market is when you start talking about these cutting edge concepts of automating processes and things like that, it seems like a lot of times I run into this thing around like, well, the vendor provides a lot of automated workflows and stuff, but you got to be on the latest and greatest release in order to benefit from that. So a lot of, I think, older so-called legacy customers, legacy ERP customers get left behind where if I don't do this massive upgrade, I miss out on a lot of these capabilities of what the vendor has been working on. And um, I think that's that's a problem. And And I'm curious what your take is as far as if I'm an SAP customer on an older release, and of course, if I'm running an older release, I don't walk around thinking I'm a legacy customer. I walk around thinking I've got a lot of stuff to do right now besides upgrade my ERP system, which works fine, thank you, aside from the fact that it's inefficient in certain ways that I've come to you know, work around and live with. So if you're an older customer, can you make strides on, on these kind of automation possibilities? Is there any difference between that versus being on S4, for example? Well, the short answer is yes, and I'll come to why in a second. But it's going to get a whole lot worse than it is today. And um, there's kind of three reasons for that. So um, the, the first one is that um, some customers are going are to be happy to move to S4. And for some, you know, if I'm doing some finance transformation and, that, and I've got an SAP system that runs finance, i got no problem with rolling an S4 upgrade into that, and that'll be a capital program, and that's fine. That's a priority for me as a business, and that's no problem. But for others, they'll be like, well, I've got other priorities right now, so I'm going to leave the SAP system alone. Um, and then and then you've got the, the RISE slash S4 thing where they're, they're pushing for a date, and they're either going to delay that date or people are going to move into extended maintenance. And when they do um, – I think that's going to get tougher again. And then the third thing is the kind of projects that people are investing in. Uh, some of them are core ERP transformation, but a lot of them are some line of business thing. I'm putting in, you know, I've got to focus on human capital management, so I'm going to put employee self-services and, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's the same story we had 15 years ago almost. But the difference is those projects are not happening in core ERP. It doesn't matter if you're using Workday or if you're using SAP because SAP solution for ACM is a cloud solution. You're not investing in core ERP. That's not, there's nothing against SAP. It's just how they've architected their platform. As a result of that, I believe that ERPs are going to have ever increasing half lives. So they're going to last even longer than they did before as their importance remains high, but their relevance to specific line of businesses, depending on the line of businesses, is reduced. Um, and as a result of that, 
um, my perspective is that we've got to build automation platforms that are agnostic to the specific release that you're on. Because you, you can't say, well, because I'm on business suite seven, you don't get any IT operations automation. Well, guess what? 60% of the install base and more are still on business suite seven. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't, you can't judge against them. Right. And do you think that's doable to create an Well, I mean, that's what we, so that's what we've done. I mean, our, our okay. point of view is if it's, if it's, if it's in support by SAP, it should be in support. And we were a bit more, we were a bit more extreme than that. That we 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 back support not with all functionality, but we we're backwards compatible right the way back to our three four point six C. We still got customers running it. I want to uh, tw- add another twist to the problem part of our conversation. The the challenges part. It came from a blog on your site on SAP automation, how to transform your SAP implementation. I'm scared to pronounce the author's name, but the, Heiko is the first name. I think. Heiko like Mandos. Uh, yes. I want to read you this phrase from his post. He says, in SAP automation, we cannot borrow from software developers or DevOps engineers. The only option is to automate based on the wealth of knowledge and experience of SAP basis engineers. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, I thought that was a very striking statement because DevOps is really where a lot of times you would think to churn for automation tips and tactics. Not to throw your colleague under the bus, but I thought it was a really interesting statement. He's absolutely right. And there's there's a few things to point out. First of all, DevOps within SAP, I'm not sure that it really exists in the same way that it does for a cloud native application. It doesn't at SAP um, Tech it, I can tell you that much, because I've gone in search of <laughs> DevOps and aside from uh what, like one or two lonely voices of, we think of Boo Boo well, on Twitter, I don't even uh you know, there there's some advocates that go way back, but aside from that it's hard to find. Well, there are companies that pitch DevOps, so you've got basis right. technologies. Um, but what they're pitching is change management, not DevOps. Uh, it, it's DevOps-like, but it's re- really basis have a change management product and they've got a test management product. And so that, there's, a, there's a DevOps-like concept, but you definitely don't have the same thing where operators are thinking like, um, like developers. And so I can, I can tell you what our approach is. Um, because we, we've honed it. And basically what we do is we hire really, really smart basis engineers um, who have you know, a desire to automate and we get them to document how stuff is done. Um, and then one of two things happens, either we hand that off to a Java developer um, to um, you know, develop uh, a piece of functionality based upon that, or more commonly now, they use our automation framework to build automation templates. And let me give you a simple example of that. Our, you know, one of our basis engineers wanted to automate the um, system refresh. And so he wrote that functionality in our automation language, which is a BPML based, um, BPMN based language for automation. He was able then to complete a template for a system copy using that. Um, that's what we're doing, but we're having to effectively retrain those basis people in automation technologies. There is no way that you could take a, a DevOps person, a chef or a puppet person and get them to do the SAP stuff that don't have the knowledge. And, and for basis people, how difficult is that change for them? Um, I, I think there, there are two types, right? There are those that want to continue to do what they've always done and they'll continue that through the remainder of their career. And there are those that want to do something different. And, you know, smart people with smart technology backgrounds who want to take their knowledge and write them into automation templates, they can do it. I mean, our technology is not particularly hard to use. So agree or disagree with the following statement. Basis engineers should embrace SAP automation if they want to remain relevant. Is that too extreme? Yeah, no, it's not too extreme at all. I mean, and it's not the only way because because of the S4 move, there will remain non-automation roles for the next 10 years. But remember, the half-life of an ERP system is 10 years, 
10 to 15 years. So no surprise. Yeah. And, you know, there's, it's a dangerous game of last technician standing. I remember early in my recruiting career talking to a COBOL programmer who was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm still doing this and I'm one of the last people standing, but there's a, that can be dangerous to hold on to the old school and be the only one that can work in certain environments as opposed to sort of saying, well, you know, how, how do I take everything I know about bases to your point? but understand like what the DevOps mentality is, like what observability is, what security in a modern context is, because that's that's something that we're not going to have time to get into in much detail today. But security is another huge, huge theme in all of this. We, we can come back to that another time. But, I, I, but I'm going to go, uh, I'm just going to point out something slightly different, which I think is even more striking. So we're seeing within our customer base, the rise of the you know semi-autonomous service provider and those service providers are hyperscale only they don't own data centers and they don't support on-premise hardware they only do hyperscale they um they don't have any india-based auto or, or other offshore low-cost location where they can do things inexpensively they hire local expensive people who are focused on automation and they use automation platforms to automate the heck out of all of this. These people have a far lower cost base than the legacy first generation service providers and the pure plays. And they are starting to kill it in the market. And I think that in the next 10 years, the, the legacy service provider that focuses on billable hours is going to be dead because it is it is it will, it will be totally wiped out by this generation of service provider that's building or building autonomous platforms now i have another bone to pick with you which is you you have a piece coming out on diginomica which may even be out by the time this podcast is out where you become a little bit of a buzzword flogger for the term hyper automation <laughs> which is a, a term that has a Gartner origin. John, why the hell do we have to use this this ridiculous nerd geek hyper automation term? Like, why should we even care? Like, isn't automation enough? Do we have to go hyper about this? Like, what is going on? Or are we just sort of rebranding to get people excited or what? I love you coming at me after this, after we talked about it a couple of times. Nice. Cla yeah. Classy, no. no. Um, I... I think it's important, uh, you know, you can love or you can hate Gartner, but they, they get to, because of their status in the market, they get to define some of what people are talking about. And I think the, the concept of hyper-automation hyper is not a bad concept. The, the point being is that we need to think more holistically about how business processes interconnect with each other and how they provide a more autonomous auto automation environment. Garner have called it hyper automation. That is what it is. I don't know whether I love the term or not, but but that's what it's been called. And I think it's going to stick. Um, and so, and I think, and I think it does matter because as a you know, what, one of the things I just give an example as me as CEO. You know, I, I met with my internal teams for our three year planning, and I said I want you to come back to me with a plan that includes hyper automation within it. You know, how are we going to build out the team that we need, focused where we can on automating the manual stuff that we don't need to do. And I think that as the CEO should be thinking about hyper automation because of that and, and call it a buzzword, but it is what it is. Right. And, and so just to be clear for the listeners who aren't familiar with the term at first glance, you might think it's about the speed of automation. So that's the slightly misleading uh -huh. thing about the term. Yeah. It's really more about, as I understand it, taking a more comprehensive approach to thinking about automation rather than, because a lot of times automation got its start in lines of business solving very focused problems, right? Uh, so, so the idea being like, we need a comprehensive strategy throughout the enterprise and we need to basically chase down every opportunity for automation that we can frigging find. Is that basically? Yeah. Well, no, yes and no. So, so, you know, this is, by the way, this is Rob Enslin's challenge at UiPath. I mean, he's got a, he's got a challenge there because, you know, when, when UiPath went to market, they, they talked about bots to solve specific problems. So, you know, I'm going to, I got a bot that does three way matching or whatever it is for, in, for invoice reconciliation. Um, though that's thinking about automation in terms of point solutions. 
you know, you can then, you know, go and maybe you you implement Solanus. And now you're thinking about how do I think about order to cache automation? Hyper automation is the level above that. We're thinking, how do I think about organization, uh, organizational automation that pan business, business process? Right. And for the record, I'm, we're not going to have a long breakdown of Gartner at the moment, but I actually quite like the Gartner hype cycle. And, and while I don't embrace all the buzzwords, I think they provoke useful conversations. My issues are more with the magic quadrant because I feel like it creates a lot of limited thinking and creates all kinds of problems uh, with uh, sort of like dictating to the market various product categories that I think are limiting for customers. So I have a big problem with the quadrant, but the hype cycle to me is actually very productive because it forces you to have these forward thinking conversations. And whether or not I, I like the term, I really like the conversation we just had. So to me, yeah, that's I, good. I get it. But by the way, just as a point of interest and kudos to, to Gartner for this, they do not have a magic quadrant for AI ops. And I talked to them about that. I talked to them about the chief analyst about it. Um, I think he's, he's gone now. But And he said, it doesn't make sense. He's like, how are you going to compare Avantra to Big Panda to BMC to ServiceNow? They're all AI ops in some way, but they're all completely different tools and platforms. We can't create a magic quadrant and that doesn't make any sense. So they have some awareness of it. Yeah, I'd like to see them do that with the rest of them, but that's 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 a conversation for another day. And and I don't think Gardner would take kindly to me dismantling their entire business model anyway. But right. but yeah, I, I think these technology the these these sort of discussions of like emerging trends and stuff is some of the strongest stuff that that, that Gardner does. So I um as as far as blindsiding you, the thing that I think you might have missed is that once you become a CEO, you don't get to play that card anymore. A, C a CEO uh. A CEO has to be able to handle anything that comes at them, dude. So, but I haven't been able to stump you at all yet. So it seems like you're getting used to used to this role. Well, you came well prepared to to, to use my words against me. So I'm, I like that. I tried, <laughs> man. I tried, man. That's 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 CEOs got to be ready for that stuff, man. So uh, it's all good. Yeah, no. Th this was very interesting conversation. Did we uh, miss any any really important points on on the automation topic? Um, no, just just though coming, just perhaps coming back to Insider then for a second where we started. I think for me the thing the thing that surprised me, the one thing that surprised me, and it shouldn't, but it did, was how focused everybody is on on S four right now. They're th and they're thinking of it as a technical upgrade, and they just want to get it done. A lot of people just want to get it done so that they don't have this date breathing down their neck. And I was surprised that in 2022 that that was a thing. I thought people would have a plan or not have a plan and be and be yeah. happy with that. But that's there's a lot of people really really worried about that. You know, over 40,000 customers, and I think they're really worried about that. And I, I was surprised. Yeah, I think S4 HANA and migration stuff there is probably beyond our, our scope today as much as the, I would yeah, love to yeah. get no, into that. No, not today. But um, but I think that that is, is – the question is how are they going to focus on other stuff when they have that? How are they going to focus on automation and everything else? Um, well, we'll see. Well, and, and, and I'll be honest with you. I think – and I don't want to throw SAP under the bus for this because – I, I understand end of maintenance. I mean, end of maintenance is a fact of life for all types of software, and it's just it's real. You know, even even running my my little company on QuickBooks, I get the old end of maintenance fun time to time. You know, it happens, right? You can't support every older release, but but to me, what I find concerning from a customer vantage point is that I want. You know, you talked about hyper automation, this holistic view. I want to see a holistic view of how we're transforming our company to better compete. And I want to see the S4 HANA conversation take place within that context. I don't want to hear about, oh, we have to just move this just because this window is closing. I want to hear a broader conversation about how can we better compete? And is S4 HANA going to help us do that? And if so, how? And how does this fit into our other initiatives, whether it's our own IT projects, whether it's our automation projects, whether it's cloud, discrete cloud projects from other vendors or 
mobile apps, whatever it is, there should be an underlying thread connecting all of this stuff. And, you know, I hope that customers are thinking like that because if they're just running around trying to upgrade these massive deployments before time runs out, I don't, I don't think I'm going to like the result and I don't think they are either. No, and I saw, I, have you heard about the SAP Move 360 program? Tell us more about Move 360, Tom. Uh, and so I, it was just something I, I just ca- I came across today and I was interested in, and um, it, it's, um, it's, it's changed its name now. Of course it has. It's now called Customer Evolution Customer Success, CECS. Uh, it's like a, I don't know if that's a play on, on kicks. Um, but, um, and the goal appears to be a sort of a, a, a customer first approach to what kind of transformation are you doing? What do you need to do? How can we support it? What, and then of course you can roll the products and you can roll rise and cloud and all the stuff behind it. But, um, Thomas's organization seems to be focused and I haven't heard much about it, but it struck me as a really, really good approach. And so I'm surprised that he hasn't got more airtime because if you take the customer perspective first, and you take that customer and come right away back to the people we were talking about at the beginning. I won't name names, but you say, right, what are your problems? Well, I can see that your problem is around wanting to do B2B to B to C and get having share of voice with customer. And but I also see that you need to modernize this thing. So we'll help you build a program and we'll, we'll get a service provider engaged and we'll get there. And then we'll, you know, we'll we'll look at get you on rise later. And I can see that you could build, you could collaborate with a customer to build a really great business and technology. Um, multi-year roadmap for joint success. And that seems to be what that organization is about. I just haven't seen them get much airtime. I thought that that's a shame. Well, it sounds promising. And if you're an SAP customer grappling with these things, it sounds like one potential resource along with user yeah. groups and stuff like that, which reminds me, I'm, I have a couple things coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm writing up something on SAP business networks. I've been a skeptic. Uh, I engaged with their team. That's going to be interesting to write about. And then I have a... Um, you still a skeptic? skeptic? Um, you know, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic of how it's been presented. I think SAP has some really interesting assets on that mm. side. And I think they can solve some real problems. And I think a lot of it is about uh, things like sustainability, actually, and, and helping uh, customers to solve really complicated problems with their supplier networks. Where I think where I've struggled with is this whole when I hear about network of networks in the keynote and stuff, I feel like that's dangerous stuff because that's just about, oh, we have the most people on our network. Uh, I, I don't like that. That that to me is kind of like, oh, you know, 70% of the world's chocolate is made by SAP. I don't like that kind of talk because I don't think it the volume stats don't impress me. It's more about like, are we solving problems for customers? And actually I think the team has some really interesting story to tell. So it was good. It was good to get my, my views challenged and uh, I'm looking forward to writing that. And then I'm going to meet with DSAC coming up too. And that's going to be interesting because as you know, the German speaking SAP user group usually brings the heat. So they're so focused. Like they just, yeah. they're, what a one track mind is great. I, on your previous point, I've, I've been thinking a bit about the difference between automation and craft, which I think speaks to your point. Because, um, you know, I always thought that the opportunity with the business network is to connect um, people that you are hard to find with with scarce resources. And, you know, one of the shames about the SAP business network is it's not really accessible to mid-market customers, not, not in an easy way. It would be really nice if it was because you've got these people that produce these scarce commodities. And how do you connect people so that they can have a business conversation? If you could do that, you could buy anything in a way that, you know, Amazon and Walmart to a degree have for customers. I, I think yeah. there's a phenomenal opportunity for the, for the scarce to scarce connections to be made. Um, just my yep my and and how do you do it with a flexible onboarding process that doesn't require you to get an enterprise license for exactly. po- potentially clunky software and and the thing I will say without revealing my upcoming post or 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 speaking for SAP is I think they're they're looking really hard at those problems and so that that's what makes the play interesting well it's it's a volume play because you can you can skim a percentage across the cost the platform as you can with eBay. I mean, I gotta give you like the example that got me thinking about it. I wanted some antique bricks and I happen to know a guy near me that does 
antique bricks and much other things. But because I know him, I can drive and I can write him a check. But unless you know who that is, you've got this scarce to get, you know, scarce customer to scarce supplier problem. And it's just, that's a huge, it might, it might not be big transactions, but because you can connect people that don't know each other, you can just skim money off the top of that. And that's value. Yeah. And I think you make a really huge point about layering the so-called intelligent matching across the top of all of that and help people once they are plugged in to find new opportunities and connections they never would have had. And once you're doing that, now I think you have a really exciting story. And so we'll, we'll have to see whether SAP can realize that, but it, it's interesting to, to have those conversations. Uh, but yeah. I think this conversation is, is over because while I, my audience has told me again and again, they like long podcasts. I think we have now delivered a long podcast and we should, we should quit while we're ahead. So, okay. but, uh, but thanks for joining me, John. That was really a great combo. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Yeah. I'm just sorry. We didn't have the, uh, the beer in hand or the seltzer in my case, but I think we simulated the, the vibe of those conversations. So. We're, we're a little early on for that. It's three 30. True that. Enjoy the <laughs> beach, man. Talk to you. Thanks.